Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to the first speaker series of the new year. Thank you for, I was going to say thank you for braving the weather, although it doesn't seem too bad right now. So I'll say thank you for braving the forecast to be here today. Uh, my name is Kate Gleason and I'm the membership director here at the Garden. And it's just wonderful to see us kick off the year in this way with such a crowd. We are busy planning with our members board who help us uh, put this program together. We're busy planning an exciting 2024 speaker series programs. If ever you have an idea for us, whether of a specific speaker or just an idea, we'd love to hear from you. You can always email the um, email address on the back of your membership card and that'll get to us. Just say it's for the speaker series. So we'd love to hear your ideas. Um, we do have a great one coming up next month. As you may know, we'll open the Orchid Show on Octo um, October, on January 25th. We'll open the Orchid Show with a member preview day. Uh, new this year, that preview will be during the day and not in the evening. So from noon to four on Friday, January, I think I said 25th, but it's the 26th. The 26th, you're invited to see uh, our Orchid Show uh, before it opens to the public the following day. And then in February, I think it's on Tuesday, February 20th, we're gonna welcome uh, Carol Gravens, who's a master gardener and a legendary orchid home grower. grower. Uh, one of our, really one of the best orchid experts in town will be here. She's gonna talk about her top 10 favorite orchids for the home. So whether you have orchids at home and wanna know if you have the right ones or whether you're just getting started, that'd be a great program. Again, that's on February 20th, Tuesday, right back in this room at 11. Registration for that is now open and then we'll register open our registration for the spring programs, which are in process now. We'll open those uh, in a few short weeks and you'll get your bulletin uh, closer to the end of February with those dates. So keep an eye out for future programs. Um, a new development for our member speaker series that we rolled out last fall, but we're sort of officially kicking off today is a new partnership with uh, our speaker series sponsor, the first ever speaker series sponsor. It's the Seitman Cancer Center based at Barnes Jewish Hospital and Washington University School of Medicine. So we're excited to bring them on with their support. We have them co-presenting with us today. I'm sure many of you got their clever stress balls. If you didn't, be sure to stop at their table on the way out. Uh, so just a round of applause for their sponsorship and for what's going to be a great partnership. And then before I introduce our speakers today, uh, just to let you know a couple housekeeping issues. We will do a Q&A after our, we have two presenters today, they'll both present. And then if you have any questions for them that you wanna share with the group, uh, you can use the microphones here. Otherwise our presenters will be available for questions after. And then outside, you can't see it now, but outside, right outside in the lobby, we will have three um, uh, plant-based businesses here to do some food sampling with us. So we have Hello Juice, Looking Metal, Meadow Cafe and Sweet Art Bake Shop and Cafe. So they'll all be here with free samples. So I do encourage you to stay and check those out. But before you start sampling, stay here in your seat when uh, Daria and Hannah end their presentation because we have some great attendance prizes as well. Uh, so please stay put until if you want a chance to win those. Now it's my great pleasure, I'm gonna introduce the garden side of our presentation today. It's my great pleasure to introduce Daria McKelvey, who's the garden supervisor of home gardening information and outreach. In this role, Daria oversees the garden's busy horticulture answer service and indoor displays. She also assists with managing the plant finder database and the gardening help website. When not giving expert advice here at the garden, Daria is out in the community giving talks like this to local and regional gardening groups. In her spare time, she enjoys hiking and nature photography. I will say she's a great follow on Instagram. Her photography is extraordinary. So uh, Daria will be up on the stage in a minute and now it's gonna be my pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Rachel Cliff, who's the Community Outreach and Sponsorship Coordinator for Siteman Cancer Center. Rachel is going to introduce our other speaker, Hannah, today. Thank you, Kate. Uh, like Kate said, my name is Rachel and I work in our marketing department at Siteman and we are so pleased to be a sponsor at The Garden um, for a few reasons. One, The Garden does so much for our community and beyond, but two, The Garden has such a great reach to our community and beyond. And at Siteman, that is our goal, to reach as many people as we can in St. Louis and our region on cancer prevention and awareness. Now when I say cancer awareness, I mean we want everyone to know when to get 
get screened, what symptoms to look for that you're having that you should go see a doctor about. And when I say prevention, I mean we're trying to educate you on things you can do for yourself to help decrease your risk of getting cancer, like eating healthy and exercise, which um, Hannah is going to talk about with you today. So like I said, we're just so happy to be here. Thank you for coming to listen to our presentation. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Hannah Rit Ritaliata, sorry, <laughs> who um, is a registered dietitian at Simon Cancer Center. So here. All right. Uh, well, I wanted to start by thanking the Botanical Gardens and the Seitman Cancer Center for the opportunity to speak to you all today. Um, my name is Hannah Retaliata. It's a messy last name, so I apologize for that. But I am a registered dietitian, um, and I'm actually a native Missourian. I grew up in Herman, Missouri, which some of you all might be familiar with, and then got my bachelor's degree down in Springfield, Missouri at Missouri State University, and then moseyed on out to Charleston, South Carolina for about seven years. I did my dietetic internship there and also happened to meet my husband. Um, while living there, I specialized in GI surgery and oncology. Um, my husband and I had a child who is now two and decided that we needed a little grandparent time. So we found ourselves back in St. Louis and I'm so happy that I found a home at the Seitman Center so I can t continue working with a population that I am passionate about. Um, you know, most of the patients that I work with are in the thick of illness. Um, so this is an extremely um, special moment to be able to talk about prevention and how we can prevent, or as much as possible, prevent us from getting in that situation. Um, do bear with me. They generally don't let me outside of the patient's room. So if I stumble a little bit on words, just you know, give me a little bit of grace. All right. So Nutrition is an awesome field. I've loved working as a dietitian. However, nutrition can be an extremely touchy subject. Um, you know, it can be a way that we bond with people. It's a way that we get comfort. It's the center of a lot of our gatherings. But it can also be um, something that gets a lot of bad press. And a lot of times it's just because of the misinformation that we get. Um, and some of that can start just from a simple Google search like the one up here on the board. You know, you might go to one site and get one piece of information and then turn around and go to a different site and it says something opposite. You might read something different on a blog and your neighborhood neighbor down the road says something opposite. So it can leave people feeling very frustrated, very confused and wondering what they can do for themselves. So hopefully today we'll talk about the things that we do know about nutrition, maybe debunk some of the myths that you've heard um, and kind of start 2024 off on a good note. So why does nutrition matter in cancer prevention? So the thing that we do know is that nutrition is related to our health immensely and it plays a huge role. Um, you know, we've seen links in cardiovascular health, endocrinology, our gut health, and like I said, the oncology world. So it can be helpful to know how cancer can start before we get into why nutrition might play a role. So I'm not a physician, so this is going to be a very rudimentary explanation. Um, but essentially, you know, our cells are constantly going over and through a turnover state. Um, through the natural course of things, there can be hiccups and mess ups that might cause some damage to our cells. And for the most part, our body has a way of regulating that. However, sometimes if that stress load is too high or we're missing a piece to the puzzle, sometimes that damage can accumulate. And that is whenever cancer can progress or occur. Um, some of these things are outside of our control, environmental factors, radiation, chemicals, viruses that we may contract, but we do know that there are some behavioral components that are within our control and certainly worth addressing. Some of these you might be familiar with, you know, sun exposure, smoking, um, being overweight or inactivity. Those last two is where nutrition starts to come in a little bit. Um, you know, through good nutrition, we can prevent obesity or we can reverse it. Um, but also on the cellular level, you know, thinking back to how I explained that cancer can occur, um, there are certain antioxidants, phytochemicals that can help to reverse that damaging process to help support our immune and our overall health. So 
Before we get too deep into this, I want to make it very, 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 very clear. There are no such things as anti-cancer foods, cancer-fighting foods, or superfoods. There are no foods that have been shown to stop cancer dead in its tracks. And good nutrition cannot negate factors such as genetics or other environmental factors. I don't say this to be a Debbie Downer or to diminish what nutrition can do. It is certainly important. Um, but I think that these terms can be a source of fear for people. It can put fear around food. It can make us question everything. And most of the times these terms are used um, as a marketing tactic. There are no legal definitions for this word. Um, so a lot of times they'll slap it on a label um, and kind of guilt us into consuming a product um, or going down a road. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, but the things that we can do, uh, the Siteman Cancer Center has created this lovely graphic. You might've picked it up at the front. Um, we're gonna talk about four of these eight ways that you can stay healthy and prevent cancer, but I encourage you to take a look and incorporate all of the ones that you can within your normal life. So the first one, helping to maintain a healthy body weight I get it. We're probably all tired of hearing about the weight problem in America. It can be exhausting hearing about it. Um, many people still associate being overweight or being obese with just an aesthetic issue or a vanity issue. However, fortunately, physicians as well as insurance alike are now recognizing it for what it is. It is a disease and there's actually reimbursement for treating this disease and because it has such a strong effect on our health. Um, obesity can cause damage within our body through several processes. You know, you'll notice on the second point there, adipose tissue or fat tissue is the site for many hormone um, production sites. Um, some of those hormones, if left out of control, can be what generates the start of certain forms of cancer, such as breast or endometrial. Um, and also being obese does just lead to a low level of inflammation within our body. It stresses your organs out, it stresses everything out within your body. And that low, low level of inflammation causes the generation of a term you might hear me say a couple times throughout this presentation, which is free radicals. Essentially, that's just an unbalanced charge within our body that can cause a little bit of destruction here and there, and eventually down the road lead to potentially a cancer diagnosis. So research has linked excessive body weight with esophageal, pancreatic, colorectal, breast, endometrial, and kidney cancers. Of those that have been diagnosed with that, about 20% of those cases can be related to the patient being overweight or obese. So it does have a big impact. Um, Weight, just like nutrition, can be a very touchy subject and it should always be approached with a little bit of clinical judgment. I have two metrics up on the board here, body mass index, or you might've heard it called BMI, which compares your height to your weight um, and waist circumference. These metrics do work for the majority of the population, but there should always be amount, an amount of clinical judgment um, used in this. So always make sure you're talking to your provider. This might not be the best source for you. I'll give an example. You might have noticed when I walked up here, I'm a rather tall individual. Somebody such as me probably shouldn't have the same waist size of somebody that's five foot. When I was in college and I was playing volleyball and I lifted a lot of weights, my BMI was 26, but I sure was pretty healthy. So. Take it with a grain of salt, talk to your physician, figure out where your healthy weight is. The next point for prevention is being physically active. Um, the reasons that we encourage physical activity is it, of course, reduces the risk for weight gain, which we just talked about why that's important. It can improve insulin sensitivity. Um, this is important just because an increased amount of insulin within our body can result in an increase of growth hormone factors, which in accumulation can result um, in the production of um, cancer cells. Um, decreased levels of bioavailable sex steroid hormones can be seen with physical activity. Um, and it also increases gut transit time. So the amount of time that it takes from us to eat food for it to exit our body, um, that increased transit time means that there's less exposure in the colon to those foods that might turn into something harmful. Um, and research has also shown that it can improve your immune function through being healthy. 
the current recommendation sits at either 150 minutes of moderate activity or 75 minutes of vigorous. So when I say moderate, generally I mean that you could hold a conversation with your friend while you're doing it. Vigorous is a little bit more breathless. I think it's really intimidating for people to tackle physical activity because they hear it and they feel like they have to commit to running a marathon. That is certainly not the case. You can run, you can dance, you can garden. I don't know about y'all, I, I do work out pretty regularly, but nothing is gonna make me as sore as bending over and picking out some weeds in the garden. So be creative with what this means to you. All right, our third and probably our biggest bulkiest point for cancer prevention today, or at least to be discussed, is eating a healthful and balanced diet. Um, this honestly, this one po point could probably be its entire presentation, so this is a little bit condensed. But one of the ways that we can look at improving our diet is by eating a diet rich in whole grains, vegetables, fruit, and beans. Um, so why that is an important thing can kind of be targeted down to one single, wor single word, which is fiber. I already mentioned before the importance of gut transit time and moving food through the body. Um, you know, it just reduces that harmful exposure to the colon in particular. Uh, it improves insulin sensitivity. It keeps you feeling full longer, so also can reduce the amount of weight gain that we might see um, or the calories consumed. Um, and it can also increase good bacteria within our gut. This is kind of a hot button um, talking point in nutrition is gut health. Um, you know, the jury is still out in terms of what exactly that means, but we have seen a correlation with good gut health in preventing cancer. Um, and our, that bacteria within our gut needs that prebiotic, which is that fiber. Um, I'm often asked by people, what is the single best food or what is the best food or what do I need to, what one thing? There never is just one thing that you need to add. There is no one food that is considered the healthiest food in the world. Um, but consuming a variety of these foods does provide a wide variety of phytochemicals, antioxidants and other nutrients that can in turn prevent cell damage. So to highlight that and just for fun, um, because nutrition is always changing, they're always looking into more, I did wanna highlight some of the key nutrients that are being looked at in terms of cancer prevention right now and to highlight why there is a good variety um, that is needed for overall health. Um, so bear with me, there's quite a few points on this slide, but um, beta carotene in carrots, butternut squash, and pumpkin, and other orange and yellow fruit foods increase antioxidant activity and can neutralize cell damage. Beta glucans, so that fiber again, which can be found in barley, oats, fruits, and vegetables, has been found to boost immunity. Ginseng and soy and edamame, tofu, and soy milk may block estrogen receptors and help prevent breast cancer in particular um, from occurring or reoccurring in survivors. Um, inulins and fructooligosaccharides and garlic, onions, shallots, and Jerusalem artichokes um, have been shown to be helpful in preventing GI-related cancers. Um, flaxseed has been shown to lower rates in breast cancer. Um, and kale, spinach, broccoli, pumpkins, egg yolks, um, those things that have lutein um, have been shown to be helpful in preventing that cellular damage, as well as tomatoes and folate in particular, um, which can be found in dark leafy greens, um, may also help reduce the pro progression of cancer. So. There's no current recommendation. It's not like I sit down with my patients and I prescribe them you know, seven servings of tofu a, a week or anything like that. Um, but hopefully you know, this is enough to motivate you in order to either add more of these into your diet or maybe try a different food completely. Um, you know, when your dietician says the you know, little term, eat the rainbow, yes, it's a catchy slogan and that's why we use it, but there is a lot of truth to it. Okay. so. While I mentioned all of those nutrients on the previous slide, um, you know, it might be tempting to really go gung-ho and give your body as much of those things as possible. There is no um, link to consuming those foods in a supplement form. And this is something that I'm extremely passionate about, and I could stand on a soapbox for hours and hours talking about supplementation, but 
supplementation is, has not been shown to help cancer prevention. Um, the supplement industry is not regulated by anyone, and in many cases, the only purpose that it can serve is lining the pockets of the person that is selling it. So be overly cautious when you're looking at supplements, um, look at their marketing strategies. If it sounds too good to be true, it is. Um, remember, there are no anti-cancer foods or superfoods or supplements. Um, and if you are going to look at using supplements, I encourage you to look at a reputable source when deciding if you want to participate in it. Um, Quack Watch is a good one, as well as Sloan Kettering has an about herbs section on their website that shows you potential side effects, potential benefits, um, if it's going to interact with one of your other medications. You know, a lot of times supplements can do more harm than good. Um, you know, I previously worked on the inpatient side and going through the pandemic, we saw so many people that were just desperate to stay healthy and I get it. So many people were just providing themselves huge doses of vitamin C, vitamin D, all of these things. And we actually saw people being admitted due to toxicity of those. So just because something is an herb or a supplement does not mean that it can't cause some damage. So um, make sure you're talking to your physician or your dietitian about anything that you are considering taking. Um, you know, there's over 30,000 things on the market and 1,000 coming on every, every year. So just, just be cautious out there. If you do choose to take a supplement, um, make sure that you're looking at one that's backed by the USP. Um, like I said, they're not regulated, but supplements can go through a voluntary process to, be, um, to check to see that what they're saying is in their product is truly in their product. If they've gone through this, they will proudly display it on their bottle and you'll see the, the emblem of the USP. The only exception I make to the supplement rule is if you're not consuming a varied enough diet, um, which it can be challenging to do so, talk to your physician. It might be worthwhile taking just a general multivitamin, and that is totally fine in most cases, um, as well as vitamin D and calcium. It's a little dreary. It's a little cloudy out here in Missouri. You might not be getting all the vitamin D that you need, and especially if you're following one of our other tips to put on some sunscreen, that means you're not absorbing vitamin D. So. Those are my only exceptions to the rule, but otherwise, talk to your doctor. Okay, so the next point in terms of creating a healthier diet um, is limiting uh, red meat consumption and processed meats. Red meats are defined as pork, beef, and lamb. Processed meats are anything that has been preserved by smoking, curing, or salting. So things like ham, hot dogs, salami, those items. Um, it's important to limit these um, just because they can increase that amount of free radicals within the body that we see um, and also pro promote the production of what we see as NOx, um, which in the body um, can be considered carcinogenic to humans. Um, especially if we're cooking those red meats at an extremely high temperature. Picture that char that you get um, from grilling or putting it directly over an open flame. Um, you know, if I talk to a patient about, you know, say they made it through their, their treatment of cancer and then I'm talking to them about how to create a healthier diet and survivorship, if I mention this limiting red meats, a lot of times the question that I get is, well, then where do I get my protein from? Because we know that protein is important as well. Um, you know, red meat is still considered safe in small amounts. Um, the recommendation currently sits at 18 ounces a week or less. So that still means that you can have your occasional burger, you can have your occasional steak. It's, it's a nice treat. Um, just don't overdo it. Processed meats, we do limit a little bit more than that. And ideally we would be eliminating it. Um, right now there is no correlation to other meat products. So meat, you know, chicken, turkey, um, and, and byproducts such as eggs and dairy. There's been no correlation to that in cancer at this time. Um, so those are all great protein sources. Or you can go completely meatless. Um, you know, beans, legumes, lentils, nuts and seeds. Those are all great protein sources and they have the added benefit of having fiber and phytochemicals. So um, consider maybe this year changing up some of your family favorites. So lentil sloppy joes, black bean burgers, um, you know, uh, I'll admit I was raised on a beef farm, so if I brought this to my dad, I think he would roll his eyes, but you know, what he doesn't know doesn't hurt him, so be a little adventuresome this year. 
All right, another thing we should consider limiting um, in addition to red meat is those things that are considered fast food, convenience food, processed foods, and sugar sweetened beverages. Um, you know, salted, heavily salted products have been linked to damaging potential the mucosal lining of the stomach um, or potentially increasing the amount of H, H. pylori colonization, which all can lead to gastric cancer or have been correlated to gastric cancer cases. Um, and then sugar sweetened beverages, um, you know, just being cautious about the sodas, sweet teas, juices, all those things, because mostly it comes down to weight management is the main reason. Um, we can guzzle down 80 plus calories in a four ounce juice without really realizing it, and that too can lead to weight gain down the road. Um, but there has also been, in, you know, those, that correlation between high sugar intake and the increase in that growth hormone from the insulin resistance. All right, our last nutrition related um, point is limiting alcohol consumption. There's been a large association with alcohol consumption um, with head and neck, esophageal, gastric, pancreatic, and GI related cancers. Um, Alcohol produces two known carcinogens when it's broken down. One is ethanol, which is it's in its normal form, and then acetaldehyde, which is a byproduct that it creates during metabolism. Both of these are considered carcinogens to a human. Alcohol makes it also extremely easy for these carcinogens to enter our tissue cells because ethanol is considered a solvent. So it's essentially prepping those cells, um, especially being aware that consuming these things in addition to using tobacco, um, works synergistically. So two behaviors to really watch out for. Um, you know, the easiest solution is make it a mocktail. Mocktails are having a moment right now. If you hadn't noticed, check your restaurants. A lot of times they're offering these on the menu. They can be fun. Um, however, if that's just not your cup of tea, just be cautious. You know, two drinks a day for males is considered moderation. One drink per day for females. Do keep in mind what a serving size of alcohol is. A lot of times we can be a little generous on those pores. <laughs> All right, so we've made it through the big bulk of you know what we know to be true in those four heavy hitting points in terms of nutrition. Um, but I did wanna take some time to go through some of the common concerns um, that I get from patients or the myths that I hear floating out on the internet. Um, so I did wanna turn this into a little bit of a game, fact versus fear. So I'll be putting up a statement on the board. Um, if you have heard anybody say this or you've seen it anywhere on the internet, just raise your hand, okay? All right, fact or fear, soy increases the risk for breast cancer. Has anybody heard this? Yes, okay. That is a fear. And in fact, research now shows that those that have had breast cancer or just in general, we would encourage the use of soy-based products, so tofu, edamame, to prevent it. Um, you know, there was always that concern, especially with hormone, sensitive breast cancers that we should be watching out for this, but that has been debunked. So eat, eat your tofu. All right, factor fear, supplementing with vitamin C, selenium, vitamin E, or other antioxidants will reduce my risk for cancer. Anybody heard about using supplements to prevent cancer? Yes, okay. So this is a fear, as I already addressed in my lengthy soapbox message about supplementation. There is no correlation to using supplements to prevent cancer. And in fact, there have been studies in individuals that already do have cancer um, where they've tried to use antioxidants to reduce the rate that cancer might progress through the use of high doses of antioxidants. And they actually had to stop these trials in some cases because it actually led to more mortality or a higher rate of death within um, that population. So again, be very cautious. All right, consuming organic foods is cancer protective. Has anybody heard that they should be consuming organic produce to prevent cancer? Yeah, okay. I figured that would be a big one within the gardening community. Um, so this is a fear. Um, there hasn't been any links that, show, that shows that inorganic products causes a higher rate of cancer. Um, you know, dealer's choice, whatever you want to do. Um, as a dietitian, we know that the consumption of a wide variety of produce is helpful in cancer prevention. And to be honest, many people I work with, um, you know, patient-wise, 
eating organic can be extremely cost prohibitive. So I'm never going to push this as a message because I want them eating all the vegetables and I don't want them going broke to do it. So, you know, nothing wrong with eating organic, but as of right now, there's no studies to suggest that that's anything that would lead to cancer down the road. All right, fact or fear, sugar feeds cancer. All right, this is one that I probably talk about at least three days, three times a day with my patients. Um, it can be terrifying. So I'm gonna call this a fear, but technically it is a fact. Reason being, sugar when consumed or carbohydrates when consumed turn into glucose within our body. Glucose is all of our cells favorite form of fuel. Okay, so yes, it technically feeds the cancer, but it also feeds your other cells. Um, if we cut carbohydrates out of our diet, if we don't consume them, trust me when I say the cancer cells will find a way. They are thriftier. If they were a car, they'd be considered a gas guzzler. They will find a way to get the fuel and all we will do by eliminating those big um, macronutrients like carbohydrates from our diet is potentially lead to malnutrition, which we do know that that is no bueno in terms of cancer. So, all right, last one, fact or fear, consuming an alkaline diet protects me from cancer. No, okay, just a couple on that one. So um, this, this I feel like was a little bit more popular several years ago, you know, people pushing alkaline, waters or alkaline um, based vegetables. Um, and there technically was a study that showed that cancer cells grew a little bit faster in an acidic environment. However, that was done in a laboratory setting in a test tube. Our bodies have a beautiful way of regulating our pH levels or that acid base balance. So regardless of how much you consume alkaline wise, it's gonna hit your stomach, which is an extremely acidic environment and it's gonna be neutralized in a matter of seconds. So um, it, does, it is certainly a fear. Oops, I lost it, there we go. All right, so um, I know that this uh, presentation was entitled um, New Year's Resolutions Worth Keeping and I didn't necessarily touch on resolutions too much. I personally am not a huge fan of them. Um, I think it can lead to um, some disappointment or setting ourselves up for failure. Um, however, I think we can do this in a productive way and I wouldn't be a good dietitian if I didn't know that nutrition was on the minds of a lot more people starting off a year. A lot of times it's a lot of people's goals to eat healthier. Um, but hopefully, you know, through this presentation, maybe we found some more realistic ways to do so. Um, maybe it would come in the form of trying to plant a new kind of vegetable, which Daria um, will be talking about here shortly. Um, maybe you could be consuming one vegetarian meal a week or hosting a mocktail party. Um, but also important, um, you know, starting any of these behaviors, um, it's important to find your community, find your people that want to support you on this. It can be challenging having behavioral changes. So finding a community, finding a support group um, can be helpful in meeting any of these goals. Okay. Um, well, I hope you all have a wonderful 2024. I will have Daria come up here now and I'll address any questions after her presentation. All right. Good morning, everyone. How are you doing? Good. Ready to start the new year off right? All right. Um, so my name is Daria McKelvey, and I am a horticulturist here at the garden. I am the supervisor for the Kemper Center for Home Gardening. Um, I wear many hats, um, and I also introduce myself as a professional plant nerd. That's, um, I love talking about plants, and so I thought it would be good to, since we're talking about New Year's resolutions and how to get healthy, um, I wanted to provide you with a couple of gardening tips uh, starting your garden this year and uh, incorporating some of those delicious vegetables that Hannah referred to. So uh, mine is Green Resolutions, a fresh start in the veggie garden. Okay. So in starting a vegetable garden or any type of trying to grow something, you kind of have to do some planning before you start thinking, you know, start planting anything in the ground. So first of all, I would say it's important to define what your goals are. What do you want to do for this year? What, is, what, is your, what are you trying to achieve with your, your garden? Um, and of course, the easiest one, the next one is, what do you like to eat? 
I know we all have our favorites. So, um, so think about that in terms of what are your goals and what do you like to eat? But again, as we're talking about the new year and how to be healthy, also think about what you can incorporate uh, to enjoy that is healthy and that you can uh, use for uh, your health. Um, the other consideration is how much time do you have? It's really important to uh, figure that out because uh, it, gardening can be a lot. Um, some of you are shaking your head like, yeah. So you do want to make sure that when you're doing a garden that you design it in the size that is going to work with your schedule. I know we have the idea of these grand gardens. We see, we see what we have out here. Um, yeah, but we have a full-time staff for that. So um, you have to make sure that you put some, do something that's going to work with your schedule and also, of course, your space. That's really important. Um, now, I wanted to give you a couple of options in terms of gardening because I know that you see the typical, you know, kind of square rectangular garden and there's rows of stuff. There are other ways of gardening that don't have to be uh, as, as intensive or if you don't have a lot of space. Um, so raised beds work fantastic. Um, you can create them all out of almost anything. So uh, cement blocks, hay bale gardening has become really popular. Um, there's even kits nowadays that you can order and you literally just slide slide the pieces in together, maybe put a barrier down, a weed barrier at the bottom, and voila, you've got a raised bed and you're ready to go. Um, you can also uh, grow plants in containers. Uh, you can use clay, ceramic, buckets, barrels, whatever you've got, and even large bags. I've had a friend that she used some of her old uh, miracle Grow soil bags to like grow potatoes and things. So that's an option too, and hey, you're being sustainable, you're not, you're reusing that plastic. And then also, if you don't have a lot of space, you can also do vertical gardens. So you can use trellises. We actually, even at our, uh, the Center for Home Gardening, we even put some things in veg uh, hanging baskets so you can hang things. And we also have been trialing out a system called um, it's called gardening, vertical gardening, and it's done by Vertical Garden Supply, which is actually uh, based here in St. Louis. And it's these kits where you can see they're hanging on the wall, and you have these sort of mesh socks filled with soil. You plant your plants in, sit it on the uh, the structure on the wall, hook it up to an irrigation system, and you've got plants. So they have a different, all different kinds of kits that you can use to uh, to grow something in your yard. Has anybody tried any of these? Anybody garden? Any, a couple of people. Oh, good. Excellent. Excellent. Um, I do also want to mention, like, on the containers, like, these are some that our staff has have designed that, you know, uh, you can also incorporate flowers into your plantings. It doesn't have to just all be veggies. Um, now, of course, you're not going to be eating the snapdragons, but the snapdragons are eye candy for you. Um, so you've got your lettuce and snapdragons. Look at that beautiful arrangement of color. You've got all different textures of lettuce, and then you've got the vibrancy of the, um, of the snapdragons. Or on the uh, right-hand side, you've got lettuce. You've got calendula, which are uh, the pot marigold, which you can actually, uh, the flowers are edible, and pansies. Now, pansies are not going to have a lot of flavor, but you can actually add them to like your salads to make things very colorful. Um, and one thing I noticed too, like um, I'm really interested in like Japanese culture, and I know part of the food that they, in terms of cooking, a lot of it is quite appealing. So it's not just the the nutrition, but it's also you have to make it look good. You know, it has to also catch your eye. That's part of it too. So this is some how way that you can also um, encourage yourself to eat something by making it look, you know. Uh, something appealing to you. All right. So now you're ready. You're ready to, you want to do your garden. You want to plant something. But before you need, do that, you need to look at your landscape. Okay. Th th this is really huge because it, uh, pr it helps to prevent a lot of problems that come up in gardening on down the road. Uh, usually when I, it, we answer thousands of questions at the garden and um, a lot of times what I find is people put the wrong plant in the wrong place. Uh, that's why plants fail. So it's important to make sure that the plant you're going to grow is going to be happy where it is. So uh, before you start planting, you want to assess your landscape. So you need to look at the light conditions. Most of the vegetables that we have around here uh, need full sun, so six to eight uh, hours of light. I think Swiss chard might get a little, sh could do shade a little bit, but most of the vegetables have to be in full sun. And since we're talking also about spring gardening, you have to also take into consideration, you're gonna be planting, these plants are gonna be growing into April and May, which 
means that leaves are going to start coming out on your trees and start shading areas. So you do have to take that into consideration that your tree that's bare right now in bright light could be potentially shading your garden later on in the year. Um, water, of course, you need to water your plants. You want to put your garden in a place that's going to make it accessible to you. I mean, you're more likely to go out and tend your garden and keep it healthy if it's closer to where like you're exiting, like your, or your uh, backyard, if it's closer to the house, you're more likely to actually care for it as opposed to putting it on the other side of the you know of your yard um, you also don't want to have to drag a bunch of hoses out like that's although that will give you some exercise so you could look at it that way but dragging a hose every day in the summer is not fun so make sure it's the water source is close and easily accessible um, you also want good drainage uh, these plants do not like to having a lot of water uh, or sitting in a lot of water so now is actually a great time if you're thinking about installing a garden in your ground uh, to get a soil test done see what your nutrient levels are see what your current um, uh, mix of your soil is and then you can start amending your soil adding compost and other nutrients to help improve it before we start with the garden season and you can get a soil test done um, at the center for home gardening we do ph only ph so we could test that really quick but if you need a more comprehensive um, a comprehensive test you will take that to university of missouri extension service and they can help you with that um, also make sure you protect your vegetables from wind and also um, critters uh, anybody got any deer yeah I know that yeah oh, oh I'm sorry I didn't yeah rabbits and squirrels and deer yeah if you've got you've got visitors um, for us here at the garden it's people so we sometimes but you might have to fence in your yard to protect it um, because they will it's like you just open the buffet they will munch it down so Take that into consideration. All right, now here comes the fun part. You get to do, this is fun homework. So, and this right, right around this time, all of us are excited if you garden because it's catalog season. So we are pulling out the calendars. We're like, oh, I want that and I want that and I want that. So as you're going through and picking out what you want, you wanna select the types that match uh, your site conditions. Again, right plant, right place. And then another common phrase is happy shoots, happy root, or happy roots, happy shoots. That's another one to think about. So make sure you pick the right plant for your location. Again, like I said, grow what you like to eat. If I, I mean, I, I'm not a fan of radishes. They're easy to grow. 30 days, you got something. I'm not a fan. I'm, not, I'm like, I'm, it'll fun to grow, but I won't really eat them. They're just gonna sit there. So I don't wanna grow radishes. I'm gonna grow something like peas or lettuce that I'm actually going to eat. But I do encourage you to try new things. Um, it's, it, it, you know, just say, just pick every, maybe one every year, try a new vegetable, see how it is. If you don't like it, fine, try something else. But that one, uh, there are so many varieties of vegetables out there. I mean, what we see in the store is like a drop in the bucket and you can try a lot of really cool things. So try something new for this year. And then of course, make sure as you're doing your homework, make sure that you research the care and maintenance requirements. That's important too, to know how these plants are gonna grow. Again, a lot of times we get people who are like, my plant died, what happened? And I'm like, did you water it three times a week or two times a week? And they're like, no. I'm like, yeah, that's why. So. All right, so we're, since we're in the spring, I'm just gonna really focus on the cool season vegetables. So arugula, beets, cabbage, carrots, garlic, kale, lettuce, peas, onions, spinach, radish, and Swiss chard. Um, now there's more, of course, but these are the ones that kind of do really well here in uh, the St. Louis area um, and that you can plant you, we are right on time for planting uh, coming into the next couple of weeks. Now, the only one that is gonna, you can't plant right now is garlic. Um, that one has to actually be planted in fall um, and around the time you start planting your tulips. Uh, so a we'll, little late on that one, but everything else you can still plant now. And what I mean by cool season vegetables, these are plants that thrive in temperatures about 55 degrees to 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, they like the cool season, of course. They can tolerate light frosts, which is great. So you don't have to freak out every time uh, we're like a cold snap is coming up. 
And because of that, we can actually do two different types of plantings. You can grow these in spring around this time, and then you can start seeds again in June or July and August for a fall harvest. So you get two seasons to enjoy these plants. And like I said, with the, the sometimes with the cooler temperatures, you can actually extend them with these row covers. So that's just a lightweight fabric that you put, pull over during the night to protect your plants. And then in the daytime, you pull it back over and allow the sun to warm them up. So this is in our vegetable garden. This is right next to our hoop house. That is a row cover right next to it. And at, towards the end of the year, I think sort of into fall, like uh, between October and November, we planted out some cool season vegetables. And I kid you not, this is what it looked like last week. Actually, this is what it looked like this morning. I double checked, it still looks this good. So next to the hoop house, we have radishes in the front. The darker green is a spinach and then more radishes in the back. Um, and so they, they're they still, pot you, you could still harvest stuff off of that. Um, it's looking a little wilty now that we're getting into January. Um, the stuff on the, I guess that's the, my right, um, the bigger stuff that has been growing for a long time. But again, we haven't really had to cover that because they can tolerate the cooler temperatures. Just a drop, you know, a low temperature is not gonna cause any significant damage. Now, I will say with a caveat, this varies from year to year. Because if you remember what happened in December of 2022, we went from a high of 38 degrees to negative six. So none of these would have survived. And actually, I'm, hope, I'm thinking that we're probably gonna be taking these out this week, because if you saw the temperatures this weekend, they're gonna drop again. So they're not gonna survive that. That's just too cold. But if we have another mild uh, season or mild winter, you can have vegetables for a long time. I mean, fresh veggies in the winter, that's great. So that's why these are uh, really great to grow. And some of the ones that are current, like you can start actually working with um, onions. You can start seeding these indoors now along, and then lettuce, kale, collards, any of the leafy greens, those can be started in February. And then in um, March, uh, you can also start your peas as well. Um, these were peas that I, I forgot the cultivar, but I grew these last year and oh my God, they were so good that as I'm harvesting them, I'm opening them up and just snacking on them. Like that's, that's what you want when you're growing your garden. Like before you can even get it home you're already like oh this is good so you like again you are not this is the perfect time to start planning out your garden you are not too late you can start this stuff indoors a lot of these plants actually you can start indoors and then move outside as we get closer to uh, the start of spring now, I, I'm not going to really talk about warm season vegetables, but I did want to throw this out there just so you can, for comparison, that warm season vegetables do require warm air and soil temperatures, so generally above 75 degrees. Um, and so we cannot grow these right now. Uh, they need a long growing season, so 80 to 100 days, and it's best to start these just like some of your other cool season crops indoors, and that way uh, when you transplant them out, you're ahead of the game and uh, the plant is more well developed and you have a longer season to get uh, fresh veggies off of it. Um, generally, we plant these after the last frost for, uh, so we say generally after uh, like late April into early May is a good time to plant warm season vegetables outside. Um, now, I'm not plant shaming anybody, but please, has anybody put out their tomatoes here or started tomato seedings? Oh, good. Thank you. You know, I only say this because it happens every January. We get a call, at least a couple calls. People have started seeding out their tomatoes in January. Okay. Don't do that. Please don't. Uh, these, again, these are warm season vegetables. If you started them now, they are going to be super stretched and super leggy. They're not going to do well. Wait until March to start them, May to plant them. Okay. Even even in the stores, like I have been out at some of the um, box stores, and I look in the vegetable section, and there's a whole row of tomato plants, like in March. And I'm like, and people are buying them, and I'm like, oh no, don't do that because if you plant those out. We get, you know, we know St. Louis, we get a late season freeze, what happens? They, it kill, it, they die, they're gonna get damaged, and guess what? You're gonna have to shell out more money for the company to, uh, to buy some more. So that's why gardening knowledge comes in handy quite a bit. Uh, just keep in mind, wait until April and May that we're clear frost, that then you can safely plant your warm season vegetables out. So beans, corn, eggplant, so on and so forth. 
Okay, if you're wondering where we get some of our um, plants from, uh, there's a lot of different sources and I'm, we're not endorsed by these guys, but these are one, two, a couple that we frequently use. Of course, Johnny Seeds, they do vegetables, herbs, and flowers. Burpee is a great company. They have a lot of variety. But one of my favorites, has become one of my favorites, is Baker Creek or Rare Seeds. Has anybody heard of them? Oh, good, yay. If you haven't, I highly recommend it. Uh, because you get, they can send, I think it's for free, they will send you this beautiful catalog and the presentation in, the, in how they arrange their vegetables and, and what they have to offer is gorgeous. Um, let's see, I mean, oops, you guys see that? Just look at the, I mean, that just right there, remember I talked about how things look, like that just makes you wanna grow that, like it's an eggplant, so, but it's beautiful how they arrange it. It's full color photos. And the thing is, like I said, what, what we see in the store is a drop in the bucket of what types of varieties you can grow. This is just a selection of the types of tomatoes that they have. These are all heirloom varieties, uh, just all different flavors, all different colors, like it doesn't, you know, so, and that's just tomatoes. Like they do this for all the crops that they have. So I highly recommend, or I would say we have, a lot of us really love Baker Creek, like just horticultures personally. Um, they have a lot of variety and it's, it is dangerous because you'll start, I started like adding stuff and I'm like, ooh, that price. Let me, let me take some stuff off. <laughs> Oh, thank you. I forgot to mention that. Yes. Thank you. They are in Missouri. They are Missouri local. Uh, did I put it on there? Oops. Yes, Mansfield, Missouri, and also Petaluma, California, but yes, Missouri, Missouri company, so. All right, okay, so once you've figured out what you've got and what you wanna do, um, it's best to kind of sketch out your landscape. I can say for watching all of our horticulturists around here, this is what they do for all the plantings and things that we do, not just at Kemper, but also here in the garden. We figure out, we figure out what plants we want and how they're gonna look in the landscape or where they're gonna be placed. Um, this will help you figure out, first of all, where things are. Uh, make sure you label uh, your plants, because I can guarantee you, you're not gonna remember what you planted a week ago. Okay. I forget all the time, so I was like, I have to label. Um, the other great thing is to create a planting schedule, and this is something I'm going to try and do more of because I usually get halfway through spring and I'm like, oh, I'd love to plant that. Oh, I'm too late. So I'm going to, this year, I'm, my resolution is to start like noting when I have to do something like, okay, I should be starting to seed out my peas now or start direct planting them so that I can uh, make sure that I will have them. And you can set reminders in a calendar. Like I'm gonna try that method too, to actually say, okay, I should be doing this at this time. I should be doing uh, planting this. That will help keep you uh, on track of things. And you can also create succession planting. So you can start, you know, plant uh, like row of lettuce one week, plant another row a second week, and another row a third week, so that you get continuous harvest in the following weeks. And so you have a continuous crop. And if this is your first time gardening, and or maybe if it's your second, your multiple times garden, uh, gardener, make sure you start small. I, again, I know as a gardener, it is so tempting to want to plant everything. Um, I will give you a personal example, and this is what you don't do, but I planted garlic this year, and I was so happy. I was like, yay. And I went back, and I, I was like, I planted 64 cloves of garlic. <laughs> I, I'm gonna have to do some thinning and rethinking. I, I kid you not, I did plant that much because I was just so happy and having fun. So that's a little excessive, but again, when you're planting this, start small, don't, don't do what I did, and just plant a little here and there. Maybe have one or two for backup, just in case you know, critter or something gets it, but plant a little bit, see how you do for the spring, and then if you, you know, like for next year, if you find that you can maintain that pace or those vegetables, then you can start adding on to your garden and add more and expand. Um, but make sure you get the flow of things and the care and everything down before you start adding more. Keep it simple. All right, so with cool season planting, um, it, it, like I said, it kind of hinted at, it is good to start the seeds indoors um, because you get a jump on the season. Um, you may have already indoors one to two months of growth compared to directly sowing your plant in the ground. Now, the exception is, and I'll provide some information in a second, but 
uh, there are some guides that will tell you whether they're better uh, plants are planted, better planted as direct transplants or starting as, as seed. Carrots are one of those that need to be started out seeded into the garden because they're they're generating a taproot. They don't like to be moved around as much. So that was one exception, but most of your leafy greens, you can start indoors and then move them outside. Um, if you've been growing them outside for a while, uh, when they're when you're ready to plant, um, you do want to harden them off. Basically, they've been in, they've been growing in indoor conditions. They don't know wind. They don't know light. Uh, you know, like true sunlight. So it's best to get them acclimated by sticking them outside in a protected site for uh, one to two weeks before that you stick them in the ground. That way, they can toughen up a little bit and be uh, a little bit hardier out there. Um, if you are planting in the soil, uh, do avoid planting when the, it's cold and wet. I remember this happened a couple of years ago and it delayed our planting for our spring, but you don't want to plant in wet soil. The soil, uh, cold soil actually can reduce germination and wet soil is just going to cause everything to rot. So you do want to uh, make sure that the soil is kind of uh, like a well wrung out sponge. Like, you know, I shouldn't squeeze the soil and water come out, it's too wet. Let it dry out a little bit before planting. But then after you plant, make sure you do keep the soil moist so that the seeds and your plants can have um, uh, can have moisture. This might come in the form of rain or it might even come in the form of snow. You know, that provides moisture too, but these plants can tolerate it. And last, uh, kind of wrapping up, a couple of um, resources that might be beneficial to you. Um, this is a catalog from Seed St. Louis. It's just seedstl.org. We love this calendar, and I, unfortunately, I printed off copies and forgot to bring them. But if you just go to Google, Seed St. Louis ca planting calendar in Google, it'll pop up. And I like this because it tells you not only what, like the most common vegetables, but it tells you whether they should start as transplants, whether also they should start as seeds, and when you should do that, when you should transplant. Um, they have the little icons uh, right over on each for each one and the ideal time to plant so it really guides you as to what you should be doing and when so as you can see uh, for January broccoli uh, we don't do well with Brussels sprouts I wouldn't do Brussels sprouts but cabbage you can actually start uh, getting ready those ready indoors by starting the seed and then plant those out in March so it's a really great calendar. Um, another resource is the MU Extension Vegetable Planting Calendar. Now it's not as detailed, but they do have uh, the most common uh, cool and warm season vegetables, the most common varieties, and also a few notes about their um, about you know whether they're resistant or what they have a good flavor, and they also have you when you should plant it out. They'll even have it for uh, cool season crops. If there's two dates for planting, that means you can do a fall, uh, spring crop and a fall crop as well. So just go to again Google MU Extension Vegetable Planting Calendar. And as Hannah kind of referenced, um, in the medical field, you have to uh, deal with a lot of false information. We have to do that as, or navigate that as gardeners as well. And um, so one way to do this is use this little trick. And this is so helpful, not just for vegetable gardening, but any type of gardening related question and uh, in other subjects too. If you go site, colon, dot edu or dot org, dot edu, will only pull up extension and university websites. That's where you're gonna get solid gardening information and tips, not something from Joe Schmo's blog, okay? Uh, .org picks up botanical gardens and arboretums, so us at the garden here. So you can search vegetable gardening, site.edu, and it'll provide resources. Tomato diseases, site.edu or site.org, and it'll provide you with information. So this is a way that you can uh, find good, good, solid information. Um, I also always warn also about advice coming from random sources on Instagram and Twitter, oh, excuse me, it's X now, and, um, and social media. Oh my goodness. Um, we've gone through, we've seen a couple of things that makes us want to scream because the information is just so wrong. So make sure you're getting your information from a reputable source, a botanical garden, a, a seed company, something that's going to have legit information because there's so much junk out there. So we want to want you to get you get you in the right direction. And kind of to wrap up, uh, this is the fun part too. 
So gardening is exercise. It's a passive way of getting exercise. And this is why I like to hike because I don't like to think about exercise. It, it just, it turns me off. So I just like it because all the stuff you do, digging, planting, pruning, removing weeds, raking leaves, haul, hauling soil or mulch. My God, that works so, your abs, your back, your arm, like goodness. Gardening is the ultimate food, full body workout. And if you think about it too, gardening is like the, the best profession or hobby you can do because you're all, not only growing stuff that's healthy, that's good for your body, but you're also getting a workout. So you're hitting all the check marks with this. Uh, so yeah, so, and you can see we did this with our, we planted the front entrance last year and you can see you got stretching, you got Tyler in the middle, you know, working his arms, you got Andrew Wyatt, our senior VP, he's, you know, lifting weights. So it's exercise. I didn't tell him I put that in there, so. Uh, <laughs> but you can see the workout, and you guys know that Have Garden, uh, it's, it, it, it really keeps you healthy. And I also noticed, or our staff, by the end of summer, all of our calves look fantastic. <laughs> because we're constantly walk, working around. So if you're, not, if you're trying to look for ways to exercise, gardening is the answer. All right, to kind of wrap up, I just want to give you a few more resources. So if you have more questions, we'll have questions and answers after this, but if you have any other specific gardening questions, you can also reach us at the Plant Doctor Desk, which is our walk-in service from Monday through Friday, nine to three. Um, during the, uh, April through October, we will also be on, open on the weekends, but you can come in, it's free with garden admission. Just walk up to the desk, any questions? I mean, we have a we answer everything, not just vegetable gardening. If you need to have uh, find a tree in the garden to see what it looks like, um, if you have pests and disease problems, if you're looking for a resource. I mean, I've even asked, answered the question, is a duck a water chicken? <laughs> no, it's not. I looked it up, but just to show you, we get a lot. So, <laughs> um, but if you can't make it in, you can also call our horticulture answer service, 314-577-5143. Uh, um, actually, I forgot, if you came, when you came in, you got a bookmark. And so it has all of our information on there. You can also email us. Uh, we, you, we can take pictures. So actually pictures are great. Uh, you can email us pictures. Um, it's a free service. You don't have to be a member. Um, we just ask that you can be detailed as uh, possible. And also helps to include your location. Like, are you in St. Louis or are you in Illinois or are you in Washington? Because we get questions all across the US and world. So. Um, you can also check our website out, gardeninghelp.org. If you've not been on that website, I highly recommend it. One of our biggest uh, well-known resources is Plant Finder. Anybody Plant Finder? Yay! We, I just looked at how many Plant Finder profiles we have. We were at uh, 8,392 as of the other day. So of all, just information on different plants, uh, vegetables, fruits, even trees and shrubs, if you're trying to find a plant, it'll tell you the growing information, what conditions it needs to grow in, uh, pictures, pests and disease problems, go there. Um, you can also follow us on social media, and these are QR codes, so if you wanna scan them and just kinda, um, and pull it up on your phone, uh, we, are, we do post information regularly. I'll give you one second. Good. Okay. And lastly, just some sage advice. Um, yeah, sorry. We're all about the plant puns. Um, just as like, you know, in our lives, especially with the new year, we need to, we all want to weed out that negativity and we also need to stay hydrated. Your plants need that too. So make sure you do stay up on top of your weeding and watering and care for your plants because they, they need it too. Um, another thing is it's okay to make mistakes. You know, there is no straight line and how to garden. Um, even the advice, you know, a lot of it, I say gardening is one big experiment. It's trial and error. So if, you, and you're gonna learn either way. If something fails, you learn. If something works, you learn. Um, but, you know, it, it helps you to build on your experiences and that's how you become a good gardener. I mean, you can ask any horticulturist, they've killed a lot of plants, okay? I hate to say it, but it's true. But that's how we've learned because we're like, oh, you know, that's how, how we got to where we are now. Um, and also don't forget to have fun with it. Like that's the purpose of this. You're, ha you're taking a new journey, trying something new you know, enjoy it. Like this is not meant to be a chore. It's meant to have fun. 
And like Hannah said too, also connect with the community, a like group of like-minded people that um, you might find some encouragement or some new th new uh, ideas for gardening. Um, we also have a huge volunteer force here at the garden. So if you're looking for something, you can volunteer to work in our gardens and, uh, and help us maintain the collections. I, s I know I have a couple of volunteers from Kemper here. So that way you can be encouraged to continue gardening, to continue this um, trek on to healthy living and you know and greatness so and with that said I wish you a happy new year and happy gardening Um, I'm sorry, I forgot one last resource that might be available for you. So I recently got this from, um, I think it's University of Illinois. You can order it online, but it says, it's called Vegetable Gardening in the Midwest. Um, I will have it up here so you can take a look at it, but it, it is very good. It has a lot of great information on how to grow crops specifically. It's in full color and it's not that expensive. I think it's about 21 bucks and you can order it, have it shipped to your house. So this is one of the latest resources we have at Kemper and I, I really like it. So so, all right, so we're gonna open the floor for questions and uh, there's two mics, uh, there's one here and one here. So um, Hannah, if you wanna come up, uh, just let us know who you wanna direct it at. Um, I cannot answer medical questions, sorry. <laughs> Yes, go ahead. Yeah, uh, how, uh, this may be more relevant to large fields, but how important is crop rotation year to year mm -hmm. in your home garden? It is important, uh, oh sorry, let me ask, ask, repeat the question. He was asking how, um, how important is crop rotation in your home garden? It is important because the, the reason why you should be moving your crops every year is because it helps to reduce pest pressures. And when I say uh, move your crops around, it's not just, um, you have to look at the family. So for example, if you plant tomatoes in one area and peppers in another, they're both in the same family and are likely to be affected by the same insects. So you want to try and rotate them to another location every year so that that pest pressure doesn't build up. Now, sometimes this is not possible. The thing is, is that if you have a small area that um, you can't, you just don't have a lot of space, you kind of have to ignore it. Um, and, and maybe if you have an issue, you a repeated issue, you may have not be able to plant that. For example, um, I have a community garden plot here at the, uh, at the Bayer Center across the way. And I noticed that we, <laughs> there's 21 beds. No one plants squash anymore because squash bugs and squash vine borer. And I have not figured out how to get rid of that yet. But um, but because it's such a high pest pressure, we don't plant it. So you may have to forego on a couple of things. If you can do it, great. If you can't, just work with you know work as best you can. You can still grow things year after year in the same spot. But if things become a problem, you know, go from there. Yeah, I was just. Wondering about tomatoes, I ate a wonderfully delicious tomato in it, in Italy, mm -hmm. in the middle of the country, and uh, I wondered what where it came from. Maybe uh, that our tomatoes are in the fri fridge too much, or mm -hmm. or they it was a homegrown one. I don't know. I mm -hmm. wondered what you th what did you think about mm -hmm. why you think mm -hmm. it might have tasted so good. It, it, well, growing, yeah, it could have been a fresh tomato. I know, and you guys can back me up on this, uh, there's nothing like growing fresh vegetables. The taste is completely different than what you see in the store. So that could be, if it's fresh, that, that could be one thing. It could also be the variety of tomato. Um, some of them have different flavors to them. Um, like the ones in Baker Creek, they'll tell you what kind of the taste is. So that could have also been the type, we may not have that here in the U.S. Or also, too, the type that's grown in the stores is not, a, they're just a, probably a general type that they can produce quickly, whereas as opposed to a specialty tomato or a specific variety. Does that make sense? Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I got a question about container gardening. Mm -hmm. Is there a flower that will contaminate my food? If I put something oh, with a flower, is there a certain flower that I should keep away from edibles? That is a good question. I have not heard, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. Um, so I think you'll be okay uh, with most of the, the, like with the ones I showed, they were spring flowers. So they're, you know, um, just stuff that you can grow early on. So I haven't heard anything, but 
note that as you're looking, doing research, if, some, if there's a note or something like that, maybe in the catalog, I've, I've not heard it again, but you know, that might be uh, where you can find some info. Okay, good, mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so the the question, um, if I can rephrase it, um, was asking if we're seeing any correlations in research with people going through cancer treatment and their gut microbiome. Um, the gut microbiome is, I mean, it, there are billions and billions of cultures, um, and it's kind of we're we're just unlocking some of that information. So. Um, in terms of active treatment, I, I don't. I'm sure that there are some people looking into how that would, how you would respond to treatment in correlation to that. But there are 100% studies out there that have looked at pulling cultures of the bacteria within a person's colon and comparing that to, um, you know, population studies as to who might develop cancer or how they might react. Um, you know, on a non-cancer related aspect, you know, they're looking at um, even um, gut microbiome affecting obesity. And they've even, in mice studies, looked at if they take a culture from a skinny mouse and put it in an obese mouse, the obese mouse all of a sudden becomes skinny or vice versa. So there's so much more to learn on the gut microbiome. So that's going to be an exciting thing over the next, I don't know how many years. You know, I just started at Siteman in June, and I have not heard of any particular research on that, but um, if so, I hope they give me a call. <laughs> um, what are your thoughts on the probiotics? I mean, some people say yes, some people say no. So because uh, her question was about the use of probiotics, um, it, it is... It's another area that is growing because there are so many strains of bacteria that can be shown to be helpful in many numerous, numerous things, and it might depend on you as an individual and what you have an overgrowth of or undergrowth of, um, whether it would be helpful or which, health, which strains would be helpful. Um, I will say that what I tell people in terms of probiotics, um, you know, it's not something that I'm opposed to, especially in individuals that have had to use an absurd amount of antibiotics in their childhood or throughout whatever, and it can get things out of whack. Some people have felt relief with incorporating a probiotic. However, it's important to incorporate one that is backed. If you buy a probiotic off the shelf and it is not refrigerated, it's not doing anything. The cultures are already dead, um, and you are essentially buying expensive urine. Um, so if you're doing a probiotic, get one that requires refrigeration. Um, the one that has been most researched is VSL number three. Um, unfortunately, it's a, it's a smidge pricey. Um, but that is the one that has been um, researched the most. Um, some people, however, when they've incorporated a probiotic have actually had more GI symptoms. Again, it just we need more information. There is great evidence to support consuming these, um, these in the form of food. So yogurts, kefir, tempeh, um, those things that are naturally um, fermented um, and can provide us some good bacteria in that way. Mm -hmm. to, uh, so the question was about turmeric. Um, so turmeric is a great spice. It is a great way to flavor our foods. And there have certainly been links in research to helping with many things, whether um, you know, there's links to um, even during cancer treatment with certain forms of medications like cisplatin or platinum-based therapies during cancer that using a supplement might eliminate or reduce some of those symptoms. There's evidence that turmeric might reduce inflammation within our body for those that have um, arthritis or some other form of inflammatory process. Unfortunately, again, um, with the supplement side of it, um, there's not been a great form of supplementation. Um, a lot of the capsules that have been that have been created have an extremely short half-life, which means that part of it has died before it's even reached the point that it could become helpful. Um, and there hasn't been any standard form of dosing available. Um, so 
Generally, it, adding it to the things that you're spicing your foods with certainly doesn't hurt, um, certainly makes it taste good. Ooh. Mm. That sounds fantastic. I'll take your recipe. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, my question has to do. Yeah, one more question. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, this is, has to do with fiber. Instead of eating all those wonderful different kinds of beans, can you just take uh, fiber gummies? So, um, this might be one area where I need to like look at myself in the mirror because I actually really do like fiber supplements in certain situations, mostly because I. Um, I love the GI field, and there are people that have certain conditions that either cause them to not go quite as frequently or they're going all day. So sometimes fiber can help regulate that, but fiber is a very fickle friend and it doesn't affect everybody the same. There's different forms of fiber. Typically the kind that you're gonna get in a supplement is going to be a soluble form of fiber, which can help in regularity, um, both by bulking the stool and by causing it to move on down the line. Um, but gummies, I'm, a, I'm not as fond of. I don't see that they're quite as helpful as using like a powder based, um, so like the Metamucil powder. Um, but again, everybody's gonna react differently. Some people that I've asked to incorporate it in to help with whatever symptoms then tell me that they just have an absurd amount of gas and bloating and we nix it. So everybody's a little bit different, but um, it can be a helpful way to improve regularity. Great. Well, on that note, I just want to thank you again. I want to thank Hannah and Daria again for joining us. And please, you can use the side doors or the back doors. We have our three vendors ready with some delicious treats. I already, I already took a little peek. It all looks delicious. So enjoy and thank you again.